Well, thank you very much, and I'm I'm glad that I followed uh, Lupita, because I think I'm going to tell you some of the same things that you heard from her uh, just a few minutes ago. So I, I picked this map of the U.S. out of Google Images because it seems to put Alaska and Mexico close to each other. I, I don't think that's <laughs> <laughs> correct. <laughs> I think you guys are south of us, and um, it's, it's actually not all that far away. <laughs> and um, the good thing about uh, being neighbors with the United States is that we have a, a lot of opportunities there for training. And so um, just to briefly break this into chunks, um, obviously you could be interested in basic research in which you generally focus on molecules, cells, model organisms, um, or you could be a clinical investigator. Um, and the, there you can do investigator-initiated research, which usually means that you're using humans as your research subject, uh, but you can also use tissues derived from humans. And then you can be focusing on clinical trials. Often these are industry sponsored and they um, take various medicines and test one person versus another or they can be involved in device development. All of these things are going on in the United States all the time. And so if you have an interest in developing expertise in these areas, there's opportunity. And, and what you would want to do if you thought that you wanted to ultimately end up focusing a lot of your time in a day on, say, studying cells or studying molecules or, you know, studying human samples, you, you would want to get tools that would enable you to interrogate uh, either the, the, the samples that you're going to be acquiring. And so you have to know how to get people into a clinical trial. No one's born knowing how to do that, but there are people that know how to do that, and they can teach you. Um, similarly, there's lots of different animal models, but you might not have any clues about them, so you can go and work with someone who is working on animal models. There's all these kinds of fancy-dancy techniques that I've listed under molecular and cell biology, but many, many people know how to do this, and they can easily train you so that you can acquire that expertise. Similarly, all of the things um, at the bottom part of the slide. So we have a number of venues in which you can do research, and I've picked out some nice ones here. I actually work at Duke. A shameless marketing here, but doesn't it look really nice? Uh, there's trees, there's Gothic buildings. I, I heard from Mauricio's son that he was in Durham. I think he's moving there. Uh, but then you could go to California and work at, at a pharma company, Genentech, for example. They have uh, clinical research and basic research there. You could go to the NIH. Mauricio was at the NIH. That's where he and I met many years ago. Uh, that big old brick thing in the middle is Building 10. You were in Building 10. So Building 10 is the clinical research center at the NIH. And at the top, there are um, dedicated centers often which are based, uh, they get their funding from philanthropy. This happens to be a picture of MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. So as you can see across the country, we have enormous numbers and sizes and sophistication of places that are doing research. And so there are a lot of opportunities. Um, and I wanted to emphasize um, the role of the ASLD in helping you access these opportunities. And I'm going to give you some personal examples. But um, Anna talked to you at lunch about the advantage of, of being a member of ASLD. And I can't emphasize that too much because the ASLD has actually helped me meet some really great people. And sometimes you look at it the other way around, like they got to meet me, but I look at it as I got to meet them because of ASLD. And a lot of these meetings occur uh, at the annual meeting um, uh, where you have early morning workshops or meet the professor luncheons or the women's forum or special interest group symposium or single topic conferences. And those are opportunities for you to be in the same room with people who share some of your interests, and they may look unapproachable, but I think you keep hearing over and over again that they're not. And I'm going to show you an example of how that works. So the heart there is around Helena Cortez Pinto. And Helena is now a bigwig in easel. 
and she's sitting up there with um, you know, some very famous guys that are on the easel governing board. And <clears throat> Helena approached me at an early morning workshop, and she said, I want to come work in your lab. And I said, sure. And I thought, this will never happen. But <clears throat> Helena somehow was able to get her university to sponsor her to come and work in my lab for a year. And during that time, she was amazing. She published a paper in JAMA that was the first paper that used phosphorus spectre NMR to measure hepatic ATP in living people with NAFL. Amazing. And she didn't never held a pipette before, but she published papers about uncoupling proteins and hepatocytes. She was no nothing short of phenomenal. I would have never met Helena had it not been for the early morning workshop at the ASLD. And she went back to Portugal with the the gather the data that she had gathered in in my lab, and she applied for a, a part of a PhD program. And she was the first physician in the University of Lisbon to get a PhD with distinction. Many many years went by. Both Helena and I are now a lot older, but we have a grandchild, and it's Mariana Machado. So Mariana works with Helena, and Helena said, oh, I think you would do great if you came to work in my lab. And so we scraped up some money, and Mariana came, and she also got a PhD with distinction, and we're actually filing a patent together for a novel cash page that may be involved in NASH. Um, but other things happen at ASLD. I met Bogona Ocha, who was at one of the SIG programs that was looking at liver regeneration. And Bogona uh, was a senior scientist in um, uh, Balboa, and she decided she wanted to look at regenerating livers and what happened to hedgehog during liver regeneration. And that led to a very paper that's gotten a lot of citations. She did very well. She became, went back and became a ministry of research in Spain. Um, and then she came across a talented young woman named Hiart Navarro, who just did some work in our lab and is now working on that for her PhD thesis. So you see, once good things start, they tend to continue. Um, Tiago, I felt I should put a man on the slide just to show you that I can mentor people of both genders. <laughs> um, Tiago also uh, met me at ASLD, and, and he's doing phenomenal work on um, schistosomiasis and has published some really lovely papers for one of the first people to show the role of this morphogenic pathway hedgehog in regulating immune responses. And now he's working down with a real excellent immunologist, Tom Wynn, at NIH. He got his PhD in my lab, and he's doing his postdoc with Tom. So just to show you that this is not an abstract concept. It really happens. People who don't know each other get to know each other because one person comes up to the other one and says, I, I think you are interested on in the same thing I'm interested in. Could I talk to you about something? And most of the time, people will say yes. So if you decide to take that leap and you've identified somebody, um, you have a number of different ways uh, or places that they might work. So I call this our diverse program portfolio. So most of the research in the United States is probably supported by the government. And um, it's called extramural research, meaning it's not done um, inside a, a government facility. So when Mauricio came to the NIH, he was in an intramural program. Anna was at, came to the NIH and was part of an intramural program. This was the heyday of liver in Washington. We had Mauricio, we had Anna, we had a bunch of people that have gone on to be quite famous in hepatology, all in the same city at the same time. So you could come in and work in an extramurally funded program, meaning you would be at either an individual lab. So I have an extramural NIH-supported lab at Duke University. Um, there are um, NIDDK-sponsored centers. This is often tends to be clusters of people working in the same area. We don't have a digestive disease center at Duke. An example of one would be, say, UNC right down the road has one. Their focus is mainly on inflammatory bowel disease. But anyway, there are, there are different kinds of places, but the point I'm trying to show you here is that there's lots of them 
and they're well funded and they have not just the person you talked to but that person is in, embedded in a very rich environment and if they're clever they will actually um, encourage you to build bridges between their program and other um, talented people who have related expertise at the institution where they are. So it's a very good way for you to get multiple skills with a, a minimal, I would say, investment in your time. This can be done in a period of time, usually in about, I would say, two years would be a minimum that you'd want to try to work if you don't really have a lot of expertise coming into it. So what's the challenge? Well, it's always all about the money. And that's the thing that limits us. When people say, you know, can I come work in your lab? I say, sure, I'd love to have you work in my lab. The issue is how are we going to pay you while you're here? Because I assume you're going to want to eat. You probably want to sleep somewhere. And so um, that takes a certain amount of funding. So how are you going to get funded? Is your university going to pay your salary when you come? If, if the answer to that question can be yes, that actually is a huge advantage because then you can come to the U.S. Yes. And what then what I provide is the research space, the reagents, my time, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't have to worry about how to pay you. If we don't if you don't have a salary, I don't basically have your salary sticking in my pocket, so then we have to apply for grants. Um, but but it's doable. So the the first challenge is getting the money to get there. Um, but that, that can be overcome. You heard, um, I think, today in Lupita's talk about language. Communication is the key to success. I'm sorry to say I'm unilingual, which is really bad. Um, all of you are at least bilingual, or you wouldn't be sitting there without headphones on, so you can presumably understand me. So um, communication is the key to success. Um, you, you have to have at least some uh, limited ability to be able to talk to your mentor. Some people like to talk more than others, um, but uh, I would encourage you, English is the universal language for right or wrong. If you know how to speak it, that's probably going to open a lot of doors for you. And people um, in the lab are also also very helpful of other people coming into the lab. And often, many of them are not, ling English is not their first language. And so um, there's some interesting uh, dialogues that come out of this multilingual place, uh, but, it, but don't let language be an absolute barrier. After you've been in the United States for a while, and particularly if you want to do clinically related research, what you will discover is that in order to touch a patient in the United States, you have to have the appropriate medical licensure. And so if you plan to have a long-term career in the United States where you're going to be doing research where human subjects are your primary area of interest, you will have to become certified. That can be done in a number of different ways. Sometimes people completely retrain. So for example, I had a very talented person in my lab. He was a hand surgeon in China. He was superb at the bench, but he wanted to become a physician scientist. So what he elected to do is completely retrain. So he redid his internship, residency, and fellowship. Um, but he was so talented at the bench that when he applied for all of these places and he wanted me to write a letter of recommendation, I said, this guy is amazing. And when he applied for his internship and residency, people were already offering him fellowship and faculty type positions. And in fact, he went to the Mayo Clinics as an intern with a guarantee to be a fellow. And he now works at the Mayo Clinics. So the bottom line is that this can happen, and a good way to have that happen is to work in a good lab with a, with a respected mentor and do a good job. And if you do, chances are you're going to be able to overcome some of these barriers, but it's not without um, some challenges, and obviously this person had to retrain. Um, other opportunities, if you don't want to totally retrain, is you can get waivers. <laughs> and so sometimes in the United States, we have underserved populations, either in um, urban areas or rural areas. And if you agree to go work there and provide service, uh, you can get trained and uh, get licensed. 
so there are ways around it and probably some of the other people who are not U.S. citizens to start with can provide you some perspective about that. I would suggest you talk to, to Anna or, or Mauricio about how, how, how you overcome these citizenship barriers. But if you want to be in the United States and you want to do academic medicine, you cannot apply for federal grants. Remember I told you all most of the research money in the U.S. is coming from the government. You have to have either a green card or be a U.S. citizen. So a long-term academic career means you, you have to kind of buy into the system. Um, so a lot of people don't want to stay in the U.S. For one reason or another, they want to go home. And then I, th I think you heard a little bit about that also from Lupita. So, you know, what are the challenges when you go home? Will you be able to do the same kind of research that you were doing in the U.S. when you come back to Mexico? Well, that kind of depends on the kind of research you're doing. Um, but I would say that we need to, to not make that a barrier. Um, so, for example, um, Mariana went, just went back to Portugal. Um, Helena is her boss. She's obviously very supportive, but they don't have the same resources we have at Duke. But that isn't stopping Mariana from doing great research. Um, she just sent sent some abstracts in where she made this unique observation that perhaps many of the people who are having acute on chronic liver failure in the ICU um, looks like they have a hemophagocytic syndrome. I thought, wow, that's a really cool idea. And that, she's very smart. Right? She, she, has, she knows that that has implications for cytokine therapies and those kinds of things. So clearly she's still thinking, she's investigating, but I think what she brings to this now is having been trained, um, she can do it a, a, probably a little bit more efficiently in a more focused way and collect information that she can then collaborate with other people to help her evaluate. We still write review articles together. Sadly, she's much quicker at turning them out than I am, and so I become the rate limiting step to her publication success. But, but there are many ways that you can continue those collaborations, and I think that it's one of the things that the ASLD and the AMH is exploring now. How can we leverage what each of us can do and complement our, our strengths? And I would, I would say when there's a will, there's a way. And um, on Saturday, I guess, I will, I will give a talk in honor of my friend Paul Angulo, who died a couple of years ago of brain cancer. And actually, Paul and I, I think one of the last papers he wrote, we, we co-authored an article in seminars in liver disease. Um, and clearly, you see some other famous Mexican guys up there. Um, so there are people that have come to the U.S., um, some have stayed in the U.S., and some have gone home. And so um, if you really want to cure a disease, you can't let the borders of countries be barriers. Because it's actually a small world. <laughs>